What's going on, everybody? I want to welcome y'all to the Pride Show. Today we have a special guest. I'm going to start off with introducing myself as Shakira. I'm going to kick it off with you. Anita. Toya. Red. Lauren. Mm -hmm. Flex. And I'm Pastor Roger Hayes. <laughs> this is our special guest for tonight. Our topic for tonight is religion and the LGBT community. So our guest speaker will kick it off tonight <laughs> and lead us into the topic. All right. So just like that, we're going to hop right on in. Well, it's really good to be here with you all on tonight. It's, um, I have really enjoyed watching the progression of the Pride show. <laughs> it has been rocking. It really has. And the energy around the table has really been incredible. And being able to see the ways that y'all are beginning to vibe with one another, it is just, it's been really great. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece of it is being able to see the great outlet that it has been. It has begun to really take shape to be a format that people can share. It's funny, you know, but it's also very real. Um, and at times you're touching some issues and situations in people's lives that go way deeper than the surface. Mm -hmm. And so I really commend you all for that. And so then tonight... We have this wonderful opportunity to really jump headlong into the topic that keeps coming up each week. Um, in some kind of way, religion works its way into a conversation when we, as same gender loving people, get together um, and begin to talk. And so tonight we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about religion and talk about this, this thing called what I call reconciling spirituality and sexuality. What does it mean to marry those two pieces of our full selves um, together? And so we're going to have some discussion about it tonight. Please bang your questions out. If you have some questions, send them, um, shoot it out to us, and we'll try to hit them as much as we can, as well as some of the questions and conversation around the table. So we're going to try to keep it up, keep it lively, um, so that we can all be moving together, all right? Um, just a little bit about myself. I am the senior pastor of Renewal Fellowship, United Church of Christ, mm -hmm. um, where we have the wonderful privilege of having the pride show. Uh, going live from this spot every every Thursday night, you know, so we're really tickled about that. Uh, we're here in Winston-Salem, located at 1350 Jonestown Road. Um, our worship services are on Sundays at 11 a.m., and so you're certainly welcome to come to an environment where you can be welcomed and affirmed completely and totally. Um, I have been preaching for about 23, 24 years. I've been pastoring a little over 18 years now. Um, I am a graduate of Wake Forest Divinity School, um, so I went to earn my Master's of Divinity, what they call an MDiv, um, and it, it, let me say it again, I earned yeah. um, my, my, my Master's of Divinity <laughs> from Wake Forest University, you know, I didn't buy it online. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with that, I, I will honestly say I'm, I consider myself a theologian. I am a student of the word. Um, I believe very strongly in the Bible and in the scripture uh, as we take it in context and we bring it into today in a ways that it can build us up and not tear us down. I believe that the scripture is to be utilized for inclusion and not exclusion. It is to build people up and not to tear them down. And any time that it's been misused, it is complete violence to the soul. Yeah. So that kind of gets us set up a little bit. And um, my goal tonight is for us to be able to have this dialogue and have this conversation, but also to be able to address, again, um, maybe some of those areas of great pain. You know, there's reasons that we don't go to church if we just get honest about it. For many of us in the LGBT community, we don't go to church. You know, we just feel like bump church. I, I got I can go wine and cheese and open houses on Sunday before I'm going to anybody's church, you know. But I also believe that there's a real reason why it's important for us to find safe places to fellowship together um, and to be um, in, in unison with one another and in places where we are safe. Where I can bring me and my love to the church. I can bring me, my love, and our children to church in a safe, healthy environment where we can be built up. Yeah. So, there we go. Hey. All right. All right we got some gotta, questions um, rolling Yeah, in. we got some we got questions, some questions rolling in. Bang, bang, bang. Let me hear it. Who wants to go ahead and read the first, the can first I ask question? question? Go ahead. You said something that a lot of people don't understand. 
Pastor, and that is affirming. Define that, please, yeah. for folks. Well, it's, it's very easy for a church to say that they're a welcoming church. Everybody's welcomed here. Everybody's welcomed here. So when you get there with that great big old welcome, you find <laughs> out that that welcome is very conditioned. That you're, you're welcome to come sit in our pew. You may be welcome to sing on our choir. You are definitely welcome to get in that tithing line, you know. Oh, yeah. But when it comes down to really serving in the church and being able to serve within that church or that ministry in such a way that you can be your authentic self, you find out that that welcome is in some ways withdrawn. And it's not genuine. Correct. Yeah. Um, but what affirming means is that we not only welcome you, but we in we affirm your personhood in the totality of who you are. We affirm that. We want to build that up. So when you would attend Renewal Fellowship, you're welcomed and affirmed to join the ministry, to work in the ministry, to grow in the ministry, to fall out in the ministry, to act stupid in the ministry, to break up three or four times with another one and another one in the ministry. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Basically, basically, basically to, to be yourself. To be yourself. Yeah. And, not be and to judged. journey exactly. together, you know? Yeah. And that's the beauty about real affirmation in a real safe place where you're not being expected to be somebody that you're not, but be your real self. Some of us are a mess. Us is a mess, yes. you know? But in, but in a place such as this, we're able to grow together um, and learn together and evolve together. We oftentimes say that we are a diverse, evolving, inviting community. Yeah. Thank you. That's cool. All right, so we're going to kick off the first question that we got in the group. I will. You want to go ahead? We got it from Lovely Jackson. What do you say to someone who says and believes that your lifestyle is a sin? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that word. Damn. <laughs> That word, you know, that word sin is the beginning and end of everything. You know, if, if, if somebody said it's not sin, then you're good. But somebody said it is sin, that's the end of the conversation. That's sin. That's the end of it. You know, mom, I think I'm gay. What? That's sin. That's the end of the conversation, right? You know, ain't nothing else to be said. That's sin. That's the end of it. Well, I believe very strongly that sin is anything that separates us from God separates us from our relationship with God. And for someone else, sin is not always defined as the same thing. Now, I'm a strong believer in that. I believe that if you, if you ascribe to, uh, sin is called, in, in, in theological terms, it's called harmatiology. It's the study of sin. It's harmatiology. And people who capitalize on sin, everything's all about sin, you know. Yeah. Generally, you find those individuals to be very judgmental people, yeah. um, people who are oftentimes depressed, <laughs> people who are not they happy. Often, sometimes <laughs> they often sin in themselves. Yeah. They, I feel like when people say it's a sin or say things like that, I feel like they're trying to take the attention off of them. Put, put it on somebody else yeah. and Correct. try to downplay somebody else for their situation one whole time. Your front porch is not as clean right. as is right. the next person. Right. And, and, that's, and that's true across the board. But what would I say to that individual? They have a right to their opinion. Mm -hmm. I think one of the greatest things that we as gay people can do is to stop living for other people. Yep. And, 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 I, and I say that from a place of journeying. You know, I'm 46 years old and I didn't get here yesterday. And I just mm -hmm. going to be honest about that. Um, I lived through that too. I, I've been engaged to a woman. I tried to do it. I, I, I did all of that. I, I've done all of that too. I did all that. I, pr I tried to pray the gay away. I tried to thank the gay away. I, 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 I did all of that. I danced the gay away. Come on. I mean, all of it. All of it. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, I think the thing that really um, led to my journey in real reconciling in my spirituality and sexuality is when I stopped allowing other people's issues to be my issue mm -hmm. and began to really live out this thing because it's only when I got honest about God, got, got honest with God about who I was mm -hmm. and who I know he created me to be that I could really embrace the fullness of that. Yeah. That's cool. I respect that. All right, we got another question. Who wants to kick that question off? Let me try to find it. Hold on. It's actually from Tamika Miller. 
This man oh, told me I'm going to hell because I'm a lesbian, and the fact my mother is a preacher, I should know better. What's your outlook on that? The reason why I'm going to go ahead and ask about this, my mom was a preacher. Um, she's passed away now, and I didn't really get the opportunity to really tell her about my lifestyle, but I felt like she understood because of who I was when I was growing up. And I've heard that so many times, but you know what? Like we were talking about the sin, no sin is greater than another because it's still a sin. It, it's your opinion on what that sin is. Mm -hmm. You can overeat, and that's a sin. Yeah. Gluttony. Mm -hmm. You can cheat on your husband or your wife. That's adultery. That's a mm -hmm. sin. Mm -hmm. So I've always felt that because my mom was a preacher, that people were like, how could you do that? That's my life. That's, she's the one who birthed me. But I was allowed to grow up as the person that I am. And if somebody can't accept that, you know, that's their fault. Because they're missing out on a great person. Not to try to toot my own horn. <laughs> Why not? It's yours to toot, bro. It's a poor frog that don't praise its own pond, right? <laughs> well, one, one thing that I would... Um, would encourage is flip this thing around. You know, we, we can oftentimes, we try to defend our personhood by comparing ourselves to others, you know? Um, so when I hear someone say, you know, well, that's what my brother was saying, you know, one sin is not greater than another sin. Well, well this is not sin. So I, so I can't even set this, so it's not even the same category. It's, it's, it's not even there. All right. This is who God created me to be. But when we flip that thing over, what would I look like trying to be someone that I'm not? Oh, yeah, people are trying to say and, oh, and, mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, and so when we talk about, you know, well, if it's all about pleasing God right. and if it's all about not going to hell and mm -hmm. <laughs> We'll make that a whole nother topic another time. Oh, yeah. I'll see what I think about that. <laughs> but, uh, but, but if it's all about not going to hell, then we have to begin to look at, then what, what would cause, if, if going to hell is a reality and it is possible, then what would send me to hell? And it would seem like to me that the thing that would send me to hell is being less than my authentic self. The scripture says in John that God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then it goes as far as to say, for he seeketh such to worship him in that way. In other words, God is looking for people who will be authentic and true. True to themselves. See? And, true and so if I go trying to uh, be with a woman, I'm going to marry her and try to live a life with a, with a woman. That's a lie. Saints and friends. It's a lie. It's a lie. I don't care how good it looks. And I can make it look good. Don't get me wrong. I can make it look good. But it would be a lie. So now how in the world can I bring that lie into the presence of God? If he's seeking those who will live in spirit and in truth, how can I bring that lie? into his presence. And so it's whenever I begin to discover and realize in who I am, truly who I am, then what does it mean to commit myself and lay myself before God in a very real way? It doesn't mean that I can sleep with every man, but I can have a man, you see. It's, that's, that's what we begin to start. That's what we begin to rationalize. That's what we begin to work this thing out and work it through. What does it mean to live a lifestyle of holiness before God as a gay man or woman? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. what, yeah, that's tr correct. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. You know, and get, get, get beyond mm -hmm. who you're sleeping with right. and yeah. deal with why you're sleeping with who you're sleeping with. Yeah. Right. And then you'll be all right. Yeah. I got a question for you. That's not on the thing. What do you say to people that step foot in a church and they try to make that church their home, but then realize that when you get in there, all they want to talk about is gay relationships and how gay is this and gay is that when your job is to preach the word to me to make me feel like I'm closer to God but instead I feel like as soon as I step foot in here I'm getting bashed mm -hmm. for just trying to sit in here and hear the word of God. I think it's very, I think one thing we really have to be honest about is, is people do what they believe. Mm -hmm. Pastors are human. Alright, yeah. now we ain't no more closer to God <laughs> than anyone else. Let's be honest about that. Okay. 
But in their humanity, it is very possible that a person can believe what they believe. And in that belief, they teach it and they preach it because that's what they, that's really what they may believe. Yeah. What we have to be wise enough. You know, the scripture says, be wise as a serpent and harmless mm -hmm. as a dove. Sometimes I just got to know when I got to get up and go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when, when this ain't, this ain't the place for me. If it's tearing my spirit down and not building my spirit up, then why am I in there? What, what am I there for? You know, but if we get real honest for a lot of us, the truth of the matter is we will go to those kind of churches and listen to those kind of messages because deep down in our hearts, we are not reconciled. Mm -hmm. We still think that maybe there is something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. We'll still think that maybe there, maybe God will change me. Mm -hmm. Maybe this will be the Sunday that he'll, he'll say something and, and manna from heaven will come falling down up on me. And it'll rain down, and I won't want a woman no more. <laughs> this desire for men will leave me in Kabasha, <laughs> and I will be delivered right. in his presence. <laughs> delivered! <laughs> and God will get the glory because I got delivered, you know? And so I can't go to an open, welcoming, affirming church such as Renewal Fellowship because that place will only curdle me in my sin. Mm. It won't convict me in my heart. Mm. And I need to be convicted till I change. And so therefore, we find many of us's yeah. in the most dogmatic and the most binding environments mm. because of that reason right there. I'm a strong believer in that. Mm. But once we begin to reconcile within ourselves, then we begin to realize, well, hold up. You let me sit in the service. And hear a pastor come out and say something bashy about gay people. I'm not going to upset their service, but I'm sure going to get up and walk out. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, but y'all remember those days of sitting in the pulpit and the pastor say something against gay people, yes. knowing that I was gay myself. And I'm mm -hmm. sitting there and I got a, amen, pastor. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> because if I sit and I don't say nothing, then I felt like every eye in the church was no looking at me. You. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And so so then so when we find ourselves cheering on our own demise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of foolishness is that? <laughs> and then whenever we realize that we cannot handle that juxtaposition anymore, we can't handle that level of dualism anymore, then we just leave the church. You have to without you without looking be. for a place where we can right. spiritually continue to grow in a healthy and safe environment. I feel like because if you don't get up and leave, you'll be, you'll be hurting yourself and yeah. you'll be feeling like, man, I got to get up this Sunday and go in this church. And no, no, they're going well that this is not where you want to be because they're not, I'm not saying they have to accept it, but they're not respecting right. of who you are. And, and that is kind of messed up because the pastor knew, but instead you'd rather continue to keep pointing the finger and yeah. pointing the blame and, Doing all that, I feel like that's childish. And man, and there, I cannot tell y'all the number of times that I've, I've witnessed this, and, and probably you all have too. When his sermon is not going too well, mm -hmm. it's kind of like <laughs> dropped him. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. it really ain't playing out well. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Throw out the gate thing. Yeah, you get some yeah. Ooh, yeah. Man, man, I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, you get it right. Everybody <laughs> start shouting. <laughs> 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 Like, it's like, that's, that's it's like Trump and his default uh -huh. to the wall. You know, <laughs> if he feels like he's losing his base, he's gonna start talking about the wall mm -hmm. and the legal aliens mm -hmm. and they're and they're rapists and all. You Trans know, and, and yeah. it's it's the same kind of thing. You know, and you all, it is spiritual violence mm -hmm. whenever it happens to us. It is violence to our soul. It is abusive. And it's we need to own that. Yeah, and, for, and a lot of us yeah, are struggling and it. dealing with PTSD from the church. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Post-traumatic stress disorder from the church. Yeah. Toe up from it's the church. It's very <laughs> tragic for some yeah. of us because, right. um, it is. Um, for example, a quick story. I was involved with the church for a long time. They didn't know I was transgendered. 
when they found out, they were like, you can't work with the kids anymore. And it was, took so much from me. Mm -hmm. And it turned me from even going to church mm -hmm. because I felt like what I enjoyed and what I knew my calling was was not going to be sufficient for mm -hmm. me. And my mom was really hurt by it, too. Because she's like, well, you're going to have to find a church. So every time I talked, she's like, have you found a church? Nope. Because I like working with kids. Mm -hmm. I was like, not yet, just, mom. But I have to find a fitting church for myself. Because mm -hmm. that just tears you away when they, when they mm -hmm. tell you you can't do something. It's just like you say, you know you're calling, and it's just like... Well, then I don't even want to step in the church again because I feel like uh, my next church, I might get just, just this worse. So that's why you do have a lot of people in our community. Instead of going to church, they just talk to God on their own time. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be like that because everybody wants to hear the word. I don't care what they've done in their past or what they are doing. Someday, some people do just want to hear that word. And for you to feel like you can't step foot in a church that might be right across from your house, like... That's very hurtful because, like, we love God just as well as a straight person or anything else. So what makes what makes us so different? Our mm -hmm. sexuality, what we do behind closed doors should not define us for wanting to know or get to better ourselves about God. Mm -hmm. That's just how I feel about the situation. Um, someone had a question for me. What do you say to someone that says to you, why change your gender if the Lord made you what you are? Mm. Yeah. Well, Pastor, you don't say what you gotta say because I, I could take it five miles and three lakes and everything else. <laughs> my nephew, my oldest nephew, his name is Ellington. When Ellington was born, he was born with a deformant with a um, deformity. He had six fingers on each hand. He had these little these little things that hung off here on the side. Mm -hmm. And um, so they asked my sister, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want to, we could remove them. They didn't have bone in them. They were just these little floppy little things, you know, on his hand. And, um, and they asked, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want to remove them or you want to leave them? Well, they serve no purpose. What are they there for? Mm -hmm. Medical science says we can clip them off, put a couple little stitches in his little hand, and the, the stitch will dissolve, it'll be healed, and he'll be fine. He's 25 years old today. And he's just fine with five fingers instead of six. Well, God gave him six on each hand. Right. Mm -hmm. right. We, we didn't argue that. We, we didn't. Mm -hmm. It was not even the conversation. Right. It was clear mm -hmm. that those did not belong. So they removed them. Right. That is the same way that I feel about individuals who are transgender. It is not that God made a mistake. It's just that they came into the world in the wrong gender, with the wrong apparatuses. And today we have science, medical ability, and enough know-how to allow those individuals to live into their full selves, mm -hmm. their God-made selves. Right. You know, y'all, I, I can think of a lot of things. You know, I, I go to the barber shop, I get a haircut. Well, God lets my hair grow. Right. So then should I just should I be a woolly man? Yeah. <laughs> God let my hair But I choose to go and get a haircut. Yeah. And if we could get if we would get out of this binary construct that makes us think that gender is either or it's not. Gender is not either or. It is fluid. I don't care who, gender is fluid. And if we can embrace that understanding, we can get okay with the fact. And some folks just flow this way. Yeah. And others flow this way. And catch me on the wrong day, my mind flow like this too. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I still walk on my tiptoes around the house. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> you know it's, so, so gender, gender is fluid. And it's not, your gender is not, about what apparatus you you have between your legs or not. It's not your gender. Gender is much more deep-seated than that. And when we really get into it, we begin to find that it really is fluid. Yeah. It really is. My answer to that, that would, to, and I said this to my mom, was when I came into this world, I was a vessel. Sometimes a vessel needs to be repainted, cleaned, mm -hmm. um, reconditioned. This vessel is being reconditioned. All the experiences that I've had prior is what makes who I am today. Right. 
Every part of my journey is what makes this person. The soul inside is always going to be the same. The mind is going to change a lot of times because as I change and I evolve within my journey, a lot's going to be growth. Amen. This is what makes me the person I am. When you all see me, you see flex. But if I was to be invisible, you would hear flex. Mm -hmm. So I always say, I'm just going through, I went through a metamorphosis. You know, God made the caterpillar and he made the butterfly. I'm flying and I ain't dying. So okay. We got some more questions. I, I got it's, it's one from LaKendra Edwards. It says, uh, "It says, uh, uh, what about when people ask, why do I want to be a man? Because I prefer guy clothes." Um, exactly. Well, I've had that question before, but you know, it is. I mean, we dress how we feel comfortable. You know, if I want to wear sweatpants today, I'm gonna wear sweatpants today. It doesn't matter how you dress, you know, I'm still a woman at the end of the day when the clothes come off. So that's my take on it. Yeah, I mean, I dress like this. It goes back to like you say, I dress like this because I'm comfortable. Like, don't take because I wear guy clothes that I'm trying to be a man. Mm. It's just me feeling comfortable in what I want to wear. Like, today I might wear sweatpants or baggy jeans, but tomorrow you might catch me in a pair of skinnies with some loafers on trying to do a classic. You won't catch me in a dress because I don't feel comfortable in a dress. So I feel like it's just to each his own. You might find you might have some studs that wear women clothes and feminine that wear dresses and stuff like that, but they still want you to prefer them as a stud. People are just reading too much into certain things like clothes are clothes. Mm -hmm. The clothes doesn't make you or anything like that. Like you say, at the end of the day, when you take off your clothes, I'm still a woman. What? So it really doesn't matter. Like, like, my, my cousin made me wear a dress to her wedding. Uh, I was an usher. I mean, a, uh, a hostess. So I made her a usher at my wedding. She's straight, and she had to wear boy clothes. So, I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, it's just crazy. Like, we got some more questions. Let me scroll back up because I know I didn't miss a few. If somebody else find one before I do, you go ahead and kick it off and read it. Y'all quiet, ain't y'all? No, because somebody said, how do you explain eunuch to the black church? Okay. The concept of eunuch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Um, well... When Jesus speaks of eunuchs, he, he says that there's three ways that a, that a eunuch is. One, they're, they're um, chose to be a eunuch by choice. And I'll tell you what that means in just a sec. So by choice, they've chosen to be a eunuch. They were made a eunuch by another human being, generally a man. And third, they were born that way as a eunuch. Now, what a eunuch is, generally, it just simply means a male without testicles. Okay, um, is, is a eunuch. It doesn't have testicles. Um, so when you think of made that way by other men, then that would be that um, maybe in certain like the pharaoh or the king would have men that work with, the, with his harem. Well, he's going to make sure that he is not able to share any children, you know, um, that, that, you know, because, hey, he may have 99 wives. Plus one, you know. <laughs> well, he can't quite get around to all of them as regularly as maybe they'd like for him to get around, you know. And so he want to make sure that the the male helpers, the male servants that are working with his harem, cannot share children. And so then, so he would be castrated, so that that doesn't happen. So that's that's made by men. Second is by choice, and that would be very much like your um, monks, your priest. Um, um, people who have made a made a vow to God, a covenant to God, um, and, and and have no interest in sex and not having sex, move off into the hills there somewhere, um, and and that's where they make home and life. And so, by choice, they have chosen to become a eunuch in that respect. All right. So mm -hmm. you telling me? I mean, because we had the same look, so it's just like I was kind of I didn't quite know what was really going on. So you telling me that monks and 
certain people that actually give themselves to God and the vow to no mm-hmm. sex or anything like that, they get their none chopped off. No, 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 no. They don't have a need to because their covenant, their commitment, is of so that they don't have need to. Yeah. You know, believe it or not, everybody, not everybody, wants to have sex. And I mean, that's, you know, yeah. so we call that most of the time we call that in the second world, you know, asexual, that they're asexual. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. They just, they have no interest in sex. Um, so no, most a monk or nuns, they don't, ha- they're not castrated in any kind of way, oh, okay. it's, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a castration of the heart, okay. you know, mm-hmm. of the soul, you know, and, and their, and their <laughs> vow to God <laughs> is of Because I felt like if I made that commitment to be a nun, I mean, a monk, and then it's like, they tell me that I'm like, all right, yeah, well. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I thought I could do this, but I really can't make that commitment right now. But what is the, what is the other one? You're and then the third one, the third one is um, eunuch um, by God, in essence, um, that they were born that way. And therein is where we grapple with um, with the sedjuant. We we grapple with the translation of the word. That we can lean pretty heavily that that would be speaking of, and we could wear that today as gay people, um, gay men particularly. Um, and let me say this about the Bible, too, as I was thinking about this on today. I think it's very important that we are very clear, because someone had a question earlier today about lesbians. And are, are there lesbians within the scripture, and can I tell them of a story about, about lesbians? The Bible was written from a patriarchal standpoint. It is an extremely heavily patriarchal book, okay? Um, So when we do see women in the scripture, some way or another, they're taking a subservient role, okay? Now, that's because that's the Jewish culture. The Jewish culture is one of patriarchal leadership, that the male is the head, okay? But now, if we were reading that same text from some of the tribes from Africa, that, that, that would be very matriarchal, that the woman is the head, that the women literally lead the family, then those stories would be very different. Very, very different. Okay? So, I can't tell you that I can just ring off a story about lesbians, no more than I can ring off a story about gay people. I can tell you some stories that we think, you know, we can kind of lean them in that way. But why are we going through all that trouble? Yeah. Like, why why do we yeah. have to take those 66 books <laughs> yeah. and carve mm-hmm. them out to fit? So we don't need that. Mm-hmm. We don't need them. Mm-hmm. That's only if we're always looking for the ways to exclude. Mm-hmm. But if we look for the ways to include, I can take those same 66 books I can take some of those same what we call clabber or clobber text in the in the in the Bible that is used to beat up gay people mm-hmm. with a gospel of inclusion to include people in. We can take those same texts and find life in them yeah. and preach that mm-hmm. life, you know, in a very real and very honest way. Yeah. So would it be rude to say that those that read the Bible interpret the way the way they see the way they interpret is the, how does it, the way they would interpret, because I was taught, I went to theology, you know, from yeah. school. The way that you people interpret the Bible sometimes is based on how they see it. Of course, mm-hmm. and your own experiences. Right. Right. You know, yeah. that's why it's so important for <coughs> us to, you know, the scripture says, "Forsake not the assembling of yourselves yeah. one with another." You know, y'all. When I say we need, we, need, we need I'm, I'm going to speak as a pastor. Mm-hmm. We need you all in church. Mm-hmm. We need you in church. We need you in a place where you can grow together and bring your experiences to the table so that we all can gleam and learn and evolve together, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, instead of keep sitting on the outside, you know, bring that, bring all that good spirit in. You got it. You got it. And like you said, you want the word, you know, so come on in with it, you know, let's see. Well, somebody on the same note, uh, lovely Jackson Said, do you believe that the Bible could be translated incorrectly? Ooh, uh, of course. Um, it, I, I believe that the text that we have today, I would be hard pressed to say that. <laughs> I'd be hard pressed to say that much of any of it is authentic. 
um, from, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, it is um, from from the various translations, from the various translations, um, from the various interpretations that we have, you know, um, the fact that even those who were translating the translation from the translation from the translation. <laughs> Even even we right, yeah. even when we look at look at scripture over over centuries, we see the evolvement um, and and how even people's own opinions yeah. weave them their way in. Did y'all know that King James was gay? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, so the very King James Bible that that we say that's the real Bible is the yeah. King James. You know, King James was gay. You know, and King James had an agenda. Um, don't you think for one moment that the politics that we see today between the Democrats and Republicans and, you know, and this great division that we're, that we sense and feel in our country today that seems to be worse than ever before. Mm. Y'all add 10 times to that. And now let's go talk about the Bible. You know, how scripture has always been used to pull apart, to divide mm. one person, you know, whoever's got it, it's like whoever's got the, um, Got, got, yeah, got the most, most or or whoever's got the hold on it this time, then they can cater it this way. And then if somebody else gets it this time, then they start catering it this way. And so then over here somewhere, somebody else gets it and they cater it this way. And so it's, it, there's been a whole lot of that. But we can't get lost in that. Yeah. We cannot get lost in that. Because the Bible is good for understanding and good for elevation. It's good for food for our soul. But it is not the beginning and end all of God. Yeah. And that's where we, you know, for many of us, we grew up in churches where the Bible was it, yeah. was it all. You know, if it is in black and white, that's it. <laughs> Literal interpretation, this is it. And whenever um, John said amen at the end of Revelations and closed the book, that's God it. went to sleep. <laughs> yeah, nothing else to say. But I, I am a true subscriber of the um, slogans by the United Church of Christ. The still speaking God. That don't put a period where God put a comma. I believe very strongly in that comma. And I believe that just as clear as God spoke to Paul, spoke to mm -hmm. Moses, spoke to Noah, spoke to Isaiah, to Abraham, God is speaking to each and every one of us. Yeah. And it is, and what God says to us is just as valid and just as important mm -hmm. to understand. And to grapple with. And we all know when God is speaking to us. Mm -hmm. We know when God gets to dealing with us in our soul, in our hearts and our soul. God is working on us. We know when God is working. And we know how we try to, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear that. I want to hear that. But we know God just spoke, you know. Right. Now, what does that mean to you? And what do you do with that? And I think that's the same, the same way we wrap on, grapple with these 66 books. We have to do the same with what God speaks to our hearts. And, and so don't get lost in that book. Mm -hmm. Don't get lost in that. We're not um, bibliology. You know, we're not worshipers of the Bible. We're worshipers of God, the living God, the bread of life, mm -hmm. who was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's who we worship. Not that book. Because check and know that that book, had a whole lot of more books that just didn't quite make it in the book. It, exactly. You know, there were other books. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think I think a lot of people get too much into religion as a as as a as a set of standards, as a set of rules, and they don't focus enough on the relationship. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and like that's something big that really took me on my walk, right. started me on my walk. Because you can be religiously immoral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me? You can be religiously immoral. Mm -hmm. I can religiously go to the bathroom every morning when mm -hmm. I get up. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's really, it is about relationship. Yeah. And it's about establishing because now it's good to talk about relationship, but also I know that relationship takes work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it takes places to cultivate, you know. Um, my husband and I, we have to work our relationship. Mm -hmm. But we don't just work our relationship in our home. We work our relationship in other places with other couples. Mm -hmm. We work our relationship in community in other areas where it can be cultivated mm -hmm. while we continue to work on it. And that's why I say it's so important for us to not only be in church, 
but be in a place where we can be completely welcomed and affirmed yeah. so that our relationship with God can be cultivated, you know? Otherwise, you know, I oftentimes say, as they say in the rooms of NA, left to my own devices, mm -hmm. I self-destruct every time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to find an immense confusion? Let me start working on myself with myself. And I'm going to run into all kind of mess, you know? Yeah. Ask your question. The one you had. The question that you had on Facebook. The one that you posted. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. How did I put it? So if someone is going to a church and they hear the pastor preaching against homosexuality, should you stay there? Out of respect and listen, or uh, could you just should you just walk? I would walk leave. Off? Now I'm saying what I would do. I would get up and leave. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what I said. Have I been in that situation before? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did I get up and leave then? No. Yeah. But I thank God. <laughs> <laughs> as Brother Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. As a child. I behaved as a child. But now that I've become a man. I put away childish things. Mm -hmm. And that would be a childish thing for me to sit there and allow someone else to speak damnation over my soul. Mm -hmm. And I know who I am in God today. The yeah. devil is a lie. <laughs> and show be damned, baby. I'm going to get up <laughs> and hit it. Right. I'm going to put my finger up. I'm going to make a, I'm gonna make an issue of it. <laughs> Turn around and make sure I got all of my fingers. <laughs> and walk up and down the center of and go head on. <laughs> and, if I see, and if I see anybody that uh -huh. hung up with me at the church or the choir or the, anything that I know, I might be like, come on. Come on. You, you want to say, girl, come on, like, come on uh -huh. down. Come on down. <laughs> come on down. Come on up and down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't hide let me, now. Let me ask you a question. Um, mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of us that are in the community that I practice Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And it is a practice. Mm -hmm. It is a practice. And there are some people that frown upon that in many of the ch many churches, even some of our affirming churches frown upon that. I have to say, I think that that is out of ignorance. And there's a lot of ignorance in religion. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Because religion is based upon a set of beliefs, ideas, concepts that have been absorbed in and thought to be true. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, the problem with religion in that is that it's an ending, that this is what we believe Period. That's the end of the story. That there is no elevation or, or evolvement that goes into that. Um, um, Buddhism is something that I, I too, embrace. Um, I've, I've had good friends who've been Buddhist. I've had, um, we've had um, Buddhist practitioners to come and to teach and minister at our church before. Um, we, we did a whole... Um, series of workshops around Buddhism um, in our church, um, Zen Buddhists particularly, uh, because it is a practice. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if you really want to know God, you got to know you. Mm -hmm. you and to. you got to, you know, even the scripture says in Psalms, that be still and know that I'm God. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing that Buddhist practices do, is it brings you to a place of stillness. Mm -hmm. Brings you to that. You know, to where you're meditating and you're, and you're beginning to reflect on that that is elevated above self. Right. That's what it's all about. Right. And, and real relationship. Listen, as long as I focus on me, Tony and I are going to have a problem. It's my mm -hmm. husband. We're going to have a problem. But if I can focus on our relationship, mm -hmm. then that means we come into that in a place of wholeness. Because you can't you know? be selfish. Exactly. Yeah. When you're in a relationship, you have to, it has to be 50-50, basically, yeah. so y'all can grow together. Because I believe 100-100. Uh, well, I yeah, need you to bring all of you. 100-100. Bring all of you. Because if you don't, mm -hmm. and you start thinking about just yourself, I guess you could say the other person gets lost trying to think about you, too, and it's not we thinking about each other. Right. So I get it. So yeah. So I'm 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 a firm believer in that. Um, e even Sunday was Easter, um, and in my sermon on Sunday, I talked about that. For me, the train stops at the tomb. Mm -hmm. um, but that's for me. The Bible says it. Jesus said of Himself that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Mm -hmm. And we we take that in as Christians that that's gospel. Mm -hmm. 
That there is no other way to God but through Jesus. We take that in. And so because we so internalize that from a religious standpoint, then we disqualify every other practice, every other way of belief, every other system. They all going to hell. Yeah. They all, they all going to hell. If they don't get Jesus, they're going to hell. They got to get Jesus, you know. I, that's not what I believe today. That's not to say that I don't believe that Jesus is the way. I believe Jesus is the way because he's the only way for me. But I can respect that he may not be the only way for my brother. Mm -hmm. And I can respect that there, my, sister, my other sister may find a path to God that might be different from my path to God. Mm -hmm. But I believe all roads lead to him. Right. I just do. I believe all roads lead to him. But for me, David, the train stops at the tomb. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm a Jesus salesman. That's what I do. I sell Jesus, you know. And um, but not and that's but that's not to say that 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 disqualifies because who am I? Who am I to say that? You know. So all right. we got a question here. We have a question from Michaela Soul. I got. She says she has a serious question. How do you deal with no knowing there are DL people in the church and people who have sex? with younger people who do, how do you deal with knowing that information? Hmm? Oh, mm -hmm. well, say that, read that again. Okay, That's so, so, so that. individuals who are DL in the church, right. and, then, and then individuals who have sex with younger people. Yes. And, I, and I, I'm assuming, maybe like we're kind of like reflecting back on molestation. Molestation, yeah. predators. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the DL piece is the DL piece. You know, they DL people everywhere. You know, um, and, and so, let's, so let's not build up the church nor tear down the church. It's just the reality. Human beings are human beings, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. but, but I do want to speak to the molestation um, uh, and the pedophile um, nature that is bred within the church. And, and I say bred because it is. Um, and I think that so oftentimes that comes out of a culture of a um, of, of bondage where people are not allowed to be their authentic selves. Mm -hmm. Then people lord over control, major control issues. I think that um, every mother that has willingly allowed her son to be molested by their pastor mm. or by the deacon, mm -hmm. she was wrong. Mm -hmm. And you all, that kind of stuff happens. It does. It does. It does. She it knew things. it mm -hmm. and she allowed it, mm -hmm. you know, because of the bondage mm -hmm. of like somehow or another, if I didn't go to church here or I don't allow, I'm going to go to hell, mm -hmm. you know. Man, I tell you, hell is such a terrible tool, right. you know, and it is such an abusive tool. But yes. I believe that um, it is very wrong. Pedophilia is wrong. Um, and I believe that we as the church uh, must hold those who have victimized children. I don't care if it was 50 years ago. They need to be held accountable. Y'all, and, and I mean that from my heart. They need to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes what that's going to require is telling the truth. You know, that some of us who got grown and knew what happened to us, to tell it. Mm -hmm. right. To break that ungodly covenant with a secret that we have held. You know, we've entered in this secret. It's a secret. And there's this covenant, yeah. like mm -hmm. this covenant of sickness mm -hmm. in this secret that I'm holding on with someone who has violated and hurt me. Because mm -hmm. I feel like if you don't speak up about it, you'll always have your relationships always. will never be what you want right. them to be because you're still holding on to that and trying to trying to keep it a yeah. secret when only your truth. Somebody can help you with that situation because the truth. Because I know it's not easy. And it gets hard, but somebody, there's groups out here, there's people to talk to because people really do deal with that. And parents, mothers, 
do allow pastors to do that to their kids because the pastor has manipulated their mind yeah. and yeah. said, well, mm -hmm. if you don't leave your son here, you're going to go to hell and he needs to get this and mm -hmm. the whole time you know. Or your daughter, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's very real. We, I think that it is, um, it is trauma. And I, and I agree with you very much that some of us practice serial monogamy. You know what serial monogamy is? Mm -hmm. I'm only with one at a time, mm -hmm. but next week I'm with another mm -hmm. one. And the week after that, I'm with another one. But it's only one at a time. <laughs> it's only one at a time. But I'm serial <laughs> about my monogamy, right. you know? <laughs> I'm monogamous. Yeah, baby, it's me and you. <laughs> you know? <This> week. But, <laughs> So, 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 so that friend of yours who's had three booze already this year, right. we have to really question that. You know? um, but I think a lot of times, some of the reasons that we struggle so in the LGBT community with having real, honest, healthy, long-term relationships, in a lot of cases because we have undealt trauma mm -hmm. that we've never dealt with. Right. You know? And so, so I want to say it again, and it's not just pastor. It's not just the deacon, but if it was your dad, if it was your uncle, if it was your brother, if someone violated you as a child and you have held that secret, that ungodly covenant with that other person that nobody else can know, tell it. Tell it. Yeah, tell it like a counselor. Somebody. Tell somebody mm -hmm. so you can begin to start doing the work of healing over that trauma and moving forward, you know? Oh, but Pastor, you just don't know what that would do. It would destroy my family. Well, well, maybe it's not the family you need to tell. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, you, maybe you need to, again, get a therapist. To get with somebody that you can get honest and unload. See, y'all, we carry stuff we ain't never told nobody. But a lot of people do feel like that. Oh, well, if I say something, it's gonna destroy my family. At this point in age, if you're grown, you can't live for your family no more. You have to live for yourself because if you keep living for your each individual family members, you will never succeed and you'll never prosper because you're always holding on to, well, what do my mom think? Or what am I? Like, you'll never feel happy within yourself and you'll never have that piece of closure because most of the time when you ask people about it, they're ready to jump to the defense. Yeah. You need that closure to be able to heal and be able to be... Because sometimes when, when that happens to people, like lovely, uh, lovely Jackson says, sometimes that kills people's connection with connection God. With That's God. Right. So That's it's right. like if they don't speak up about it, you won't have that connection with God to make that next. You won't be able to close that chapter in your life. And I don't care if you're 50, 60 years, 60 years old. And it happened when you were five. And you'll never you're be able to close it. You're stuck right there. And yeah. y'all, that's, that's the thing about trauma, you know, that... Even in our country, you know, um, studies say that 85% of people will at least three times in their life have a diagnosable mental illness. 85% of people at least three times in their life will have a diagnosable mental illness. But yet we shame people around mental illness. And we will not embrace the need for help. Well, in in our community, in the African American community, mm. you're supposed to go to church, right. pray about it, right. leave yeah. God. Right. You yeah. know, you get sick down with uh -huh. all like fried chicken, yeah. and you're supposed to be healed. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you and you're still mm -hmm. suffering with that trauma. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and I taking out of context because the word says prayer, um, faith without action is dead. Right. Faith yeah. without works is dead. Right. So how are you sitting around praying? But not doing anything. not doing anything yeah. about it. And you and we're yeah. carrying that trauma in our bodies. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm serious about that. We carry that trauma in our bodies. And um, you know, understanding my call. Energy. Yeah. Call, understanding and and, that, and and going back to the Buddhism, it's you know, energy. that 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 is a that those kind of practices are ways that we can begin to kind of deal and heal from some of that stuff. Yeah. You but let me be honest, you can't do it by yourself. Right. right? You, you you can't even in NA in in AA in SA in EA you know EA you know RA they tell you you gonna have to get with somebody 
and tell it. Yeah. You've got to unload it. You know, step four and five, you got to work them. You know, mm -hmm. it's part of the journey, you know, unloading that stuff so that you can heal. You and can know? I say something too? It's not only for the gay community. Right. Mm -hmm. We got straight friends out there that's dealing with this also. Right. Mm -hmm. But every gay person is not gay because they got molested. Yeah. Right. Amen. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Or trans a lot of people, yes, they, 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 that yeah. is not the case. Not Everybody like was moms, molested. Not like of dads. Yeah. It's just something that has occurred in their lives. Yes, we were, and when they say we were born this way, we were born this way because this is my cousin right here, Red, and me and her grew up together and we, we know, we know. But Red was like, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you know, I, I think a lot of times, a lot of times for us, we, we find, um, going back to the question earlier about the mother being a pastor, and you speak to your mother being a pastor, um, oftentimes parents want to find, figure out what happened. Mm. You know, they, they think. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks yeah. ago in you all's conversation, somebody hit on that um, briefly, that in that coming out process, you know, we, we want to talk about our coming out, but what about our parents coming out, mm -hmm. you know, and my mother had a real coming out journey with me. You know, because I came out kicking the door open and boom, here I am. You know, yeah. and uh, you know, right? <laughs> you know, you know. But then, but then my mom, she she had her process. She had her time of grieving the son that, that she believed I was going to be. You know, um, and y'all, that it didn't happen overnight. You know, I was about nineteen whenever I came out. So honestly, I had nineteen years to get to where I was whenever I came out. But then I expected my mom to be okay with it okay. the next day. Mm -hmm. right. You know, at least, at least I could give her, if I took 19 years for me to get all right with it, maybe at least I could give her five. Right. <laughs> maybe, maybe five. But, you, right. but <laughs> Pastor Hayes, don't you feel that your parents already knew anyway? Because they, I, I, they do, I, I, I do think that. I yeah, do think that. Now, I some, now some parents will, will say no. They, they had no clue. They just, you know, like out of the like blue somewhere. I do too. I, you I know, feel like they <laughs> lying. Think of memories that my mom... We say we can go to Brindles over here on Peters Creek Parkway, and I would say I want the baby doll. I didn't want the GI Joe. Mm -hmm. I just bought the GI Joe because that's what they wanted me to get. But my mom understood that I had Shira, I had all the other ones. <laughs> like that. He's right. naming the cabbage <laughs> patch. Right. 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 But I just feel like our parents know, and they just they live in a world of denial. Yeah. And then our, but whenever we let them know and we let them understand, I feel like some of them will understand. See, I didn't have the chance to really get that because most of my parents are past. Mm -hmm. So they just, I just felt like they just passed and this is new. Just because yeah. they named me Lauren. They <laughs> <laughs> so, you was a girl. That's, <laughs> my, that's my government name. So <laughs> my, that was what I was born with. So, so however he comes, you know, that's um, there are um, Indian tribes as mm. well as tribe um, indigenous. tribes in um, indigenous people indigenous. that do not name a child mm -hmm. until that child's personhood begins to take mm -hmm. shape. Their mm -hmm. personality begins to form. And so then around the age of about five, mm -hmm. that they literally have naming ceremonies, you know? Um, and, and, and then they're able to embrace the two spirit from the, from the, um, from an Indian standpoint, that the two spirit, that mm -hmm. it's, it's a person who, who is transgender, what we would call transgender, you know, or to be able to embrace somebody who it's very clear that, because y'all, when I was five, it was clear. I was, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I mean, you know, yeah. some, and, some but denial is a powerful thing. Children. We just got to be clear about that. Denial is powerful. Is. And like, parents can like live in denial. A, you ever know somebody that was in a relationship with somebody that knew they was cheating? Right. But then when they actually heard the words and <laughs> caught them cheating, they just broke down. Just, oh my God. It's oh, Lord. But you already really knew. Yeah. It's, it's kind of the same thing with with some parents. I think once it, it's, it's like, okay, I think it's, I, I, I think it's there. Like, I would have rather been outside playing football. Mom kept me in the kitchen. Like, right. she yeah. wouldn't let me get my hair corn roll when I was younger. Like, that was going to change something. But, like, she knew it. But when I actually said it, it was kind of like a... Uh -uh. How, uh -huh. yeah. how, how valuable do you all think that it is to, because we're about it in a time, two things. To come out to self and to come out to family. How valuable do y'all think that 
It's I healthy. think it's coming out of self healthy. first. First. Yeah, self because first. you got to understand mm-hmm. who you are. Right. And then once you can embrace who you are, you need to share it with your family and your friends. And honestly, I think it's ourselves, our friends, and then our family. Because mm-hmm. our friends are our family that we make. Right. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll, they'll hold you. Yeah. I feel like yeah. We, tend to, we tend to tell them more than we would our, 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 our love family. Family. Right. Yeah. I feel like it's best to come out to self first because even, I feel like because when you come out to yourself first, you get tested. You get people bashing you. You get people saying stuff to you and everything like that. So you have to come out to yourself first, then your family. I don't care if nobody else accepts you and your family, your grandmother, your grandfather, your cousin, your parents might not understand in the beginning because they do need time but at the end of the day your parents will have your back no matter what because at the end of the day they don't see they don't see gender they don't see oh my child is gay they see this is my child this is my baby this is my that that sounds good but we know that that's not true about the situation you know some parents are 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 evil okay yeah you're right because i did did see a story on facebook where a guy he asked his mom and his father to come to the wedding and it was like well you know that's that's not a that's not a part of oh. religion. I mean, beyond that, I mean, you've got teenagers who literally Kill they're they're, they're, they're put out the house, you know, like, man, at seventeen. Yeah. They're, they're put mm-hmm. out. But literally. when I say mother and father, that doesn't necessarily that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm saying somebody who gave birth to you because Amen. we do have houses right. that have right. a mother and a that's father. Right. That's what that friend just as mu- yeah. just as more than the people that birthed you and yeah. will care for you and everything. So even if you can't come out to I mean, when you do come out to your parents, you have other people you can call mm-hmm. your mother, your father that will support you and help you grow as a person. So I just feel like it's 2018. We have the resources now to where you can reach out. Back then, I understand it was a little harder for people, but now it's at a point where you can reach out. You have a so renewal fellowship, hand. United Church of Christ, 1350 Jonestown Road. Right here in the beautiful city of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. We welcome you to an environment of love, care, and concern. We're not a perfect church by far. We're human beings. But we're growing together. So we invite you to come out worship with us again. 1350 Jonestown Road, Sunday, 11 o'clock. Come on, let's get it in together. All right? Let's grow together. Thank you all. Um, questions that did not get answered, y'all, I'll go through tonight um, and look through some of those. And I'll try to answer some of those questions um, in reply on this evening because I know there was probably a lot more that came through. Um, but we really hope that you're able to get something tonight and, and be benefited um, by this. Our whole goal was that somebody's soul will be pricked and figure out and find out that not only does God love you, but you can love him. All right? God bless you. We love you. All right. All right. Love us. <laughs> Pride love See you ones. next week. See you next, next week. week. Share, <laughs> like, tell a friend to share, tell a friend share, to tell share, a friend. Share. <laughs> <laughs>